we matching? We always do that. Dude, I was representing today. I was like, we need to wear Happy Rabbit merch when we actually like film Happy Rabbit shit. We need more merch. That's smart. We need more merch. Get your merch. We'll we need like little me. cute merch packages that we can give people when they come over. See, if we actually were on our shit, we would have something like, here's a water bottle and like, yeah. thanks for showing up, Chris. Yeah. We have shirts. Welcome, another Happy Rabbit podcast. <laughs> we're here, we're doing it. We got special guests. We got our boy Chris. Cope is here. Um, introduce yourself, though. What's up, Chris? Hi. <laughs> Chris Cope. We make movies together. We're friends. We do cool shit, dude. Um, How close do I have to be to this thing? A you can safe distance. Like, yeah, like you feel I'm good here. You're good there. Like, you you don't have to lean it in. May, it's it more like bite. right here, and then we keep it that way. You can look at us. You don't have to stare at cameras because okay. it's a podcast, not. Is that what we do? Yeah, that's what we do. Cool. cool. So yeah. cameras aren't <laughs> just here. talk normal. You're just hanging out the boys. We got some whiskey. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Speaking of, that's what we got going. It's a great morning when your buddy's drinking coffee and you're breaking out the whiskey. I'm so on the coffee, man. <laughs> Jameson, also not a sponsor. <laughs> I wish I would take an alcohol Jesus. sponsor any day. Was that a lot? I love the space. You I don't did know. a great job down here. We try. Love the lighting. Thank it's you. It's changed a lot since you've been here. Last it's night. changed a lot since I've been here. Big things are happening here over at Happy Rabbit. We yeah. got the psych wall done. We got a makeshift green screen. We got editing bays. office space and editing bays. It's coming together. It's coming together. It's yeah. nice down here. We're already looking at a new space to be <laughs> to come to be determined. Coming in the future. Coming to you soon. Coming this fall. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it. sooner. Salt Lake City. Um, but that's super exciting. <clears throat> so good things to look forward to. How uh, big is the space? What are you guys looking at? A lot of things to consider on that front, um, which is actually we're going to talk to you after the podcast today about some back end stuff that we think you'd be about. Cool. Yeah. Love it. Let's, uh, tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Uh, what do you do? Chris Cope. Uh, local filmmaker. I produce very low budget movies and I'm an assistant director in town on higher budget films. Uh, quasi DGA because it's a right to work state so I can get away with things you can't in other states. Don't come at me. What does that mean? Uh, so as a member of the DGA, you cannot participate in non-union films. Whereas in Utah, which is a right to work state, I'm a DGA qualification list member, which means I have enough days accrued on projects to make me eligible for DGA projects. But I have not paid my dues to be a part of the union yet because I work in a right to work state. There's not enough union work here for me to commit to being. How come I didn't get that deal? Because it doesn't exist for camera. It doesn't exist it. for camera. Well, that's bullshit. I paid a shitload of money and there's still no work. Dude, unless yeah. you're like actor <laughs> or DGA. Everybody else is just garbage. I get it. Yeah, the unions are terrible. There's, <laughs> wow. a, there's actually a big push among cinematographers to join DGA. I could see that, though, because yeah, really? with our hours and everything, and then with the lack of work, and then they don't like when we work on non-union stuff, it's like our hands are kind of tied. Well, it's just, and, and the insurance and pension and back-end participation in films is much better for DGA people than it is in 600. And so there's a big push among 600 DPs to leave 600 and join the DGA. Uh, operators and ACs and stuff would not be included in that deal, but you know it's in the name, Director of Photography, so it like, makes sense. They should have better residuals, better insurance, more fun. <laughs> more money. I more get money. it, more money. More, money. <laughs> more fun tokens, Speedy likes those. More money, more problems. And more fun. fun tokens. And more fun. fun I call fun tokens. Dude, my wife hates it. Every time, <laughs> every time I get fun tokens and I go play, she's like, it's not a thing. And I look at life <laughs> go play. like a playground, and when I get fun tokens, I go play with them. Yeah. It's money. It's money. When you were at the arcade as a kid and your parents gave you like a little cup of coins and such, you went and played. When so I you said play- as a kid. <laughs> I have been to Nickelcade in the last three years. Point proven. You're Point still proven. in the dream. But yeah. when I was a kid, before Nickelcade, you actually had to have tokens. It wasn't nickels that you were putting in there. It was like actual tokens. Now it's like know. quarters, bro. I know. I went the other like on a date night, and I had a card. You had to like upload money on it. <laughs> yeah. I played like five games, and it was like 20 bucks. Yeah, yeah. you swipe the card. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's bullshit, yeah. dude. A lot Ski of the tokens, was like $3 though. $3 a session. I was like, what? I remember when it was a nickel. Where were you at? You don't have to plug. Was it the, All Star Lanes or something? 
place in Draper, the bowling alley. All-star. All-star. Yeah, it's them. Have you been, do you like quarters? Have you gone to that I like establishment? Quarters. Yeah. I don't think I've been there. It's, it's pretty fun. There's two. There's one in Sugar House and there's one in downtown. Quarters is like an arcade bar downtown. I have been there. Drinks are he said bar and I knew not great, bar. but uh, a lot of fun. They've got a bunch of ski ball. They got a bunch of pinball and stuff. The one in Sugar House is more pinball and ski ball. Uh, not as many arcade games per se, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Just shout out, shout out quarters. Maybe maybe not we go sponsor. to quarters. Not a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we're gonna do. This is is list off things and tell them they're not sponsors in hope of sponsorship. Yeah, we need to work on that whole sponsorship thing. Some Utah brand should get behind us. We need a liquor sponsor, a bar sponsor, <laughs> um, a nightclub sponsor. I mean, the um, only people that are listening right now are from Utah. So, Come hey, on. High West. We check our algorithms. <laughs> a distillery. High West, Uinta. Moab yeah. Brewery. Moab, Moab Brewery. Come on, people. We Dented could, Brick. We could get in this. It's called supporting local. Support locals. <laughs> um, so Do Chris, your duty. You, you and I getting into the film industry when we met. Where did we meet? We met for the first time on High School Musical: The Musical: The Series. We did. You came out for this crazy, elaborate, beautiful set that we spent three days rigging with Grip and Electric and building out the art before those three days. Uh, we brought in uh, Travis Pastrana's wife yep, Lindsay. to come Shout and choreograph all oh. of these crazy bike and skateboard yep. sequences. Yep. Yeah. The dude from Glee. The d- um, choreographer from Glee. Yes. Like yes. What were you? Super nice what, guy. What, what were you doing on that? He came just for the stuff at Saltaire. Brent yeah. brought him out. And he was shooting uh, on the floor with like a DSLR camera. We had all our cameras going, yeah. but Scooter was dancing around with the bikes and the scooters and the huh. skateboards and stuff. Which... And we spent so much time and money on this set. And on my, like that whole situation. And it was so cool. And then you turned on the episode and they used 25 seconds and it <laughs> just showed Josh walking in. He was skating for a second. Said two lines. Said two lines to, I don't remember her name in the show. Uh, said two lines to the girl. Sophia is her name in real life, but I don't I don't remember her name in the show. Gia, I don't, I don't maybe? Uh, he talks to her for three seconds, and then they cut out of it. We had shot all these crazy, elaborate <laughs> dream sequences. That, it's cut out so we can talk about it. Of but, course. Uh, I mean, it's out now anyways. They brought know. some of the biggest professional athletes. Curtis was there. Yeah. Um, so they had BMX riders, skateboarders, like all these guys. They had like a week of choreography going into this. They built ramps, mini ramps. We had BMX bikers flipping over skateboarders. It was a full skate park. Yeah, like riding on walls. And then essentially myself with action sports background and camera operating, I was riding in between them, like doing this choreography with the riders Looking back on it, kind of silly that they had me out there with like a DSLR when you guys had all the nice camera rigs. Like now that I'm on movie sets, looking back on it, if some kid came out with like a DSLR and was skateboarding around, I'd be like, who what? the hell is this what? kid? Like, well, to be fair, I think we <laughs> shot season one on Alexas. I don't, be- I don't know it if was we, on Alexis. I don't think we shot LF. So the the form factor for the DSLR camera you were on would work with it, it would work with, and I was shooting like Canon C log and everything yeah yeah but, but but everything you were shooting was supposed to be part of this like crazy elaborate like taking you out of this high school musical do- mockumentary world into like this crazy action sequence edit. everything how made sense it, yeah how yeah. they sold it to me was like fish eyes skate edit getting out of the cine stuff and going into this like cool actiony world which it would have worked. Oh, but for sure. They didn't use so we, we did that set, and we did another one that was crazy elaborate. They built this crazy chess set. Oh, that's uh, so cool. Yeah. I think her name was Gia in the show. I think that was her name. And she was dancing in this crazy elaborate chess set with this... It was all black and white. It was crazy. They built like nine tiers high and had dancers in each square of wow. this uh, thing. And they it did this super, rad dance. super cool. cool dance. Super rad. Scrapped it. What? Yeah. They, the amount uh, of money the that money. goes into some of this stuff. Oh, they did it like three scratched. times. We did it, and then the other one was when Matt was singing uh, the song through the hallway set that we built yeah. on the dolly, yep. and we had to pull him through, and I was just wrangling cable behind yeah. the dolly. Yep. But uh, we did these three crazy dream sequences. That, that's originally how the show was written, and Disney got them, and they said, we don't want to do these dream sequences. So we this is this is 
six weeks into production, they've probably spent two million split between those three different events. That's a day yeah. of production. Oops, a day of production on each of them, and so much money. And they got the dailies, and they said, "Yeah, we don't like the dream sequences." Oh, <laughs> wow. Yep. And so it's just it's all this. Time. We went back. We went back and reshot them totally different. Yeah. Too like crazy. That the one that Matt we ended up replacing. It was just him singing this. Not as good. Bad song in the living room to so Ashlyn. Bad. Yeah. Not as good. No, it was terrible. It was so bad. Uh, yeah, it was. It was just such an interesting thing to see a production of that size figuring out what it was. Like it ended up. Did it do four seasons? Yeah. High School Musical did four seasons. They yeah, did the one in L.A. Cool, and three yeah. here. It's it, such like a staple of Utah. Yeah, and it has film. been for has twenty been. years. You yeah. know, like to see the completion of High School Musical through the series. Uh, here in Utah was great. It was just crazy to be a part of a production with that much time and that much money to just go, we didn't like that. It doesn't fit what we want from the show. Tim, you did a great job. We loved what you were thinking, but we don't like it. And they just scrapped it. I want to dive into that a little bit because at least for myself going into Hollywood and like you hear about, I mean, for what comes in my mind is Fast and the Furious, how they go through hundreds of cars in a production or they'll ruin an entire street. Everyone loves to like think about that stuff. What was the, your first experience where you were like, okay, this is real. They just threw away $100,000 of stuff, and now we're just moving on. Uh, okay, the first one that I can think of uh, is I was working as a rigger on uh, Yellowstone, mm. and we built the stage. Uh, we did all the electrical work, hung all the lights and stuff, and, and so much of it was superfluous. Is that the right word? Super. I don't even know what that word means. Over the top. Yeah, I was like, that went over my head. They, uh, the guys, <laughs> there was this guy, Eric, and this guy, Tino, that came in from L.A., <gasps> and their only goal with our rig was to make it the biggest rig Utah's ever had, previously held by uh, John Carter blood, oh, blood and oil. Blood and oil. Blood yeah. and oil. And they just were like, whatever we do, it just needs to be bigger than that. And so we spent all this time and money Texas doing mentality. this. Uh, and it was cool. So it was super cool, like seeing all the cable drops, seeing all the lights we put up was incredible. And then I went out onto set one night. Uh, we had rigged up this giant moon box above this prairie set where uh, Kevin Costner comes in on a helicopter and starts shooting uh, all these Native Americans. Like fight, it's like a gunfight between all these Native Americans and Kevin Costner's people. Um, and they shot it all night. I showed up in the morning to derig the moon box. They brought it down. We took off our 16 sky panels. We took apart the speed rail. We took apart the truss, everything that was up there. And as we're taking the last piece of equipment down, this additional second AD comes running down the hill. Like we spent five hours derigging this and this additional second AD comes running down the hill. It's like, we didn't get everything. We need this again. <laughs> oh, oh, and so we had just like loaded the last piece of gear and the, the rigging gaffer just looked at us as like, Okay, put it back up. Okay, back up. <laughs> so there's like eight of us who were just like, okay. Right. So we rebuilt this giant moon box because there was just such a lack of communication on a show that it was, it was crazy on a show that size that it wasn't more organized. But then you come to find out over the course of all these shows that have happened that that's just how they are. Like yeah. the people in charge on all of these big shows that have come here and go to Montana and, and Texas now uh, – it's very much so they have a plan. I feel very bad for the assistant directors because they, they propose a plan. Everybody signs off on it. They go on the day, and then whoever's in charge goes, you know, actually, that side of the mountain looks better. Yeah. Let's I, all move over there. Yeah. You don't know how many times on set I'm so happy that I'm just like a yes man and get in my like little camera truck. And just totally. Because I'm like, off. if I had to deal with, yeah, I mean, it's just like, yeah, we're out. If I had to deal with all that back end or like, communicating we we're on a we we're doing a movie roughneck where they didn't have location permits on one of the days and they're like we're just going for it and like the whole time like neighbors it was a night shoot and neighbors were coming out screaming cops were coming and like crew were all just like Dude, we're gonna go wait in the camera they truck. were drilling like full lighting fixtures 
into the side of this apartment without telling anybody <laughs> right next to these people's windows. And these ladies would like open their window. Like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, sorry. And there's drilling and dust <laughs> going in the window. We won't name the gaffer, but I know who that <laughs> was. Yeah, yeah I, I was can... like, I don't, I'm new to this. And I know that's not how we're yeah. doing this, boys. <laughs> Alex, is, it was Alex's first movie. And he like comes over to me. He's like, are we going to get shot or are something? Are we going to get shot on my first movie? I'd Probably. Do like two or three before Probably. I take my first shot. It's a good shot. thing we know the cops. <laughs> <laughs> do know the cops. We've given we've, 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 We've given them a lot of coffee and a lot of donuts yeah. over the years. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. My whole relationship with cops completely changed when I started getting on set. They became from like those guys that would like stare at me to like now my best friends. Hey, same. <laughs> <laughs> same. Been through it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I think for me it was uh, the Lindsay Lohan set when we needed to do the side of the mountain. And we were supposed to do something hanging off, like her falling off a cliff. Or, oh. And they're like, oh, we'll just build it. And I was like, what? what? And they're like, yeah, we're just going to build a mountain in this parking lot. And next thing you know, trucks of snow and plows. And they just start building up essentially a mountain in the middle of this parking lot with all this rigging. And I was like, oh, yeah. For reference. Yeah, we're not going on the mountain. We're just going to build it. Right for here. reference, this is in Falling for Christmas when Tad... The George Young character and Lindsay Lohan, he brings her up to the top of the mountain and he proposes to her. And uh, she starts sliding back on her skis and the snow breaks <clears> apart. <throat> uh, she falls off one side, he falls off the other side. And the, the whole idea was we can't find anywhere where we can push Lindsay Lohan down the side of a mountain. So Safely. we had uh, the team at Roundy FX build this crazy elaborate drop stage um, oh yeah, there was a stage inside the mountain. There was a stage inside the mountain. Doors and everything else. Yeah, and yeah. it had a drop on one side and uh, just a slide essentially of snow on the other side. And so when Lindsay Lohan's uh, stunt double went to the top, there was a, a drop down uh, platform that she just. Was that Amber? It was Amber. Yeah. Nice. We're having Amber on. That was too. the worst day on that set because <laughs> there was four versions of Lindsay Lohan all in the pink. There was our, our, our photo double, Malia, who's like, great. Amber yeah. Reyes, the stunt double, who's great. There was Lindsay. And then there was, um, I don't remember if it was a stand-in or who it was, but there was four versions in that pink whole ski suit with the pink froofy hat. And I remember walking out and being like, I, I can't do this today. And I just walked right back into my trailer. You know what's hilarious about that is that that was Lindsay Lohan. And the only other time I've heard something similar be said, it was on a podcast. And I think it was the DP who did, what was her movie as a kid? Where, they, where they switched the parents? Oh, Parent, Parent, Parent Trap. Trap. Um, and the DP of that, he was talking about how confusing it was because he didn't know which one was the actual Lindsay. Because when they're all little girls. And they had like eight of them because they only had limited time with youth. Yeah. So they used eight of these little girls. And he was talking about how they had a 12-hour day and dividing and conquering like that, which I thought was cool. But he was saying like the same thing. And I keep thinking about like the day we had four of them. And I'm like, how come that's a common theme with Lindsay? That's a, com <laughs> that's a common thing. That's how she started. She's, how she started. Yeah. <laughs> She's got all these doubles on I always set. have ten of me. What do you mean? The worst part of that day was we showed up and we had hired an outside key rigging grip to come and put up these uh, 12 by 12 blue screens around that set. And when I showed up in the morning, it, it, it had not happened. Uh, the guy did not call. He did not show. That's fun. I love and that. so I've got actors in hair and makeup knowing that it's going to be two or three hours before we could put them on camera. Like there was just too much work to do because we have these petty bones and lifts going up in the air with these uh, blue screens to build the digital world behind them. And the key rigging grip just didn't show up. <laughs> See, there's so many things that one of those days. Like, there's so many things that go into a production. It's really cool seeing your perspective of it because obviously on camera, we're limited to so much information throughout the day, and you're dealing with it coming from so many different like places and so many things. Like to be fair, set is also the most gossipy place in the world. So I'll hear the wrong thing before I hear the right thing. I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll hear from uh, number four grip on the call sheet why we're not shooting yet. <laughs> when I know what, why we're not shooting yet. Oh, my, my favorite is like when a... <laughs> the crafty guy walks up and is like, did you hear? And I'm like, where, where are you getting this Every, information? Everyone matters, but nothing's worse than when a PA comes up to you or someone who doesn't know you're on camera 
and they're coming up to you saying like, oh, something's wrong with camera or whatever it may be. And you're like, no, no yeah. that's not what <laughs> we're doing. It is, it, it, it is crazy how quickly something somebody will say that's wrong spreads through all 50 to 100 people on set. Oh, yeah. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I know what's going on. And it's fun to listen to what comes back around. Like, What's that oh, did you hear that she got punched in the face and we've got to you. cover her? We've got to cover her bruise. And I'm like, what? Yeah. So and so has a tattoo. Real life story. On a movie. So <laughs> it was a thing that was going around that this girl had a tattoo like on her chest. Never was a thing. But everyone's like, you have to cover her tattoo. And everyone's like freaking out about it. Never had a tattoo. Never had a tattoo. So it's just like a thing that everyone was talking Something about. Scooter never said. <laughs> it took me a second to get that. Like, what do you mean? Bro, I'm blasted. I'm inked up, cuz. Dude, uh, for me, there's like three movies that come to mind for Wasteful. Obviously, Blood and Oil is one. John Carter on Mars was another one. And then John Carter on Mars. What's the Johnny Depp? Oh, Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger. Oh, were you on that? Holy crap, dude. Shout out Arnie Hammer. Not yeah. a sponsor. <laughs> All three of those movies were just like, dude, Don Johnson was like in Blood and Oil. He came in, like they built his house, right? They built his house on a soundstage and he comes in and says, I don't like that, 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 and that, right? Already built. And we're talking like walls and like they did like these veneer finish on the walls, you know, which is like a thousand dollars a square foot yep. to do like all this stuff and he's like i don't like that 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 this needs to be real they brought in real granite because he didn't like the fake granite on the countertops <laughs> what like we're, oh for reals dude like i like that bougie stuff yeah dude. and then like we're talking like full-blown like five six thousand dollar couches like like chairs what, like tons of stuff right what happens to it after it goes to don johnson's house the oh. I was about to say, whoever's paying for it, executive producer is going to take it. Literally, dude, like when that Copy. show canceled, all the shit just disappeared. Like, <laughs> same night. Everybody, we're, dude, we're talking like $20,000 rugs that were just like went missing. After that high school musical shoot, they yeah. gave us the the full half pipe, like a $10,000 half pipe that they needed gone and removed. And they said, whoever can remove it can have it. I got a piece Crazy. of art from that set. It's Which still in badass. my house. In I his love living it. Room, it's sick. I love it. Oh, man. Sorry, There's probably still keep stuff going. In, Sorry, like, I was curious. He wanted no, they were granite. they were panels. You oh, they, they were they didn't have anything else painted palace. the inside of it. They were all they, everything was panels. They painted four by a lot of like four by eight sheets of wood yeah. or canvas pieces. That's, That's for cool. the salt palace. For right? the salt palace, yeah. yeah. They they were not allowed to paint the inside, so they had to put up wood oh, yeah. or canvas. Interesting. Yeah, and I took one. That's I cool. got one. It's cool. I love it. But sorry to interrupt you. You wanted real granite. Back to your story. Yeah. I don't know. I could, I could go on. So he had to have real like diamond cufflinks. So if you watch that show, like he's wearing, you know, like eight hundred dollars shoes. Like he's wearing like a I'm five not gonna or six lie, thousand dollars suit. If I'm suit. an actor and I can get away with it, like I'm gonna get a new. But watch, the thing is, they get some but shoes. they couldn't. They didn't like we were like out of money. Every episode, they're like, "We're out of money." You, you don't have a, you don't have money to get a light, but your lead actors like, Damn, "Yeah, my new." They're this, like, new "We don't have time for overtime today because Don Johnson had to have his like." He wanted the leather Four couch. Four carat gold cufflinks. <laughs> hey. Or diamond. Man, yeah. have diamond. Man, diamond. Have. Man. I haven't gold. experienced. 24 I think you've four carat Yeah, 24 carat. I think you measure carat. gold in carat. I just don't you think, do. a, I don't carat. think four carat gold would no. be very much money. It would be. It <laughs> they like put that on top of a steak gold, these days. Four carat gold diamonds. The higher the gold, the softer it is. I know that. Yes. Okay. That's why it's like 14, typically, 24. But yeah. something that came to my mind was, <laughs> we, we, you were DPing this movie too, but Cope was producing it. and um, If I was producing it, we didn't waste any money. I'll just say that right <laughs> no, now. No, this, <laughs> this was the funniest shit on set I've ever seen. We show up this day, it was on a soundstage, and we're supposed to be shooting inside of this hut, essentially this fort that they built. And mind you, one of our actors who was like the bad guy is like as big or bigger than Cope, which is almost impossible. And these big football player dudes, right? Cope goes into this thing and looks like a dog in a dog house. And this person's supposed to be walking around. Next thing We're you supposed know, to have a fight scene. There's a fight, fight scene. scene. And Cope's <laughs> like this in this box. He goes, we built this for a fight scene? <laughs> and then I just see one wall get kicked down, another wall get kicked down, and the whole thing just comes apart. He goes, we're rebuilding this shit. This is bigger. This needs to get bigger. That, <laughs> was, awesome. a, that was one of like the 
the weirdest days I've ever had on a movie production is walking in and seeing this Box. dog shed. <laughs> it built. literally like, was. Like, uh, for reference, our, our actor is 6'4", 260 pounds. Just like giant man. Giant. Who's wielding a machete, and, <laughs> and he's supposed to be throwing this girl. And the place when I walked in was six <laughs> foot long, four feet deep, and the highest point of the ceiling was six foot two. It was an outhouse. It was an outhouse. Yeah. He couldn't stand oh, up, man. let alone like, fling a machete yeah. around or throw people. Uh, and that was just that was a really tough night. I was up till about four a.m. <laughs> getting panels from a previous set that I had helped build and. Buying art for a different room. That was a it was a wild day on we a wild production. We that day looking at Cope like bust down these walls, and then we show up the next morning, and the thing was like twice as big. So I definitely respect you on that. <laughs> <Need to be laughs> All nighter. And it, but like, but that's the reason why Chris is where he is now. Yeah, he's absolutely. like willing to like throw down and get the shit done to like to make the job happen. Do you think that's what got you to where you are? Because like you. I think we've talked about it before. You haven't necessarily been in the film industry for, you've been in it for a while, but like not like a I'm 20 still, year history. Yeah, so I'm how still did you fairly new to the film industry. I started in the year 2017 <clears throat> of our Lord and Savior. Uh, Cope and I started the same year in film, I want to say. I think part of the reason why I've been successful is because I say yes to projects that other people won't because I, I love helping smaller productions that I believe in, like, or the director or the producer, like friends or uh, somebody that I think has the opportunity to make a movie, whether, whether they come out good or not, I'm willing to go help people with my small amount of knowledge that I have. I, I'm willing to go help. Whereas other people will, will say no. Now, um, I also love making movies. Like that's a big part of it is I, when I show up, you can either have the attitude of, why is this happening? This sucks. This isn't how it should be done. Or you can show up and figure it out and try to shoot a movie. Because I enjoy it. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, film, uh, without jumping heavily into my background, uh, has done a lot for me in my life. Coming from a place where I couldn't get a job. And I was living at home. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm making some money as a grip or an electrician. And just found this community of people that are just so cool and so understanding and there's no background checks. Um, <laughs> and nobody gives a shit about and nobody, your background. Nobody either. gives a like, shit about it's this. You yeah. can have tattoos I, and blue hair. I've always <laughs> said, um, I've compared filmmakers to carnies. Like yeah. we go somewhere, there's this group of people, there's the bearded lady, there's the strong guy, there's the performers. We all go, we set up a bunch of tents and lights and we put on this act for a day and then it all goes back in the trucks and we go and do it again the next day. And it's just like this super tight knit group of people that have no business being yep. together and being successful. You take any of us like individually and you'd be like, who the hell is that person? But you put us together and it's like a power unit. Uh, it's a, it just turns into like this crazy little powerful family of people all driven to the same goal. Now there are some bad eggs for sure. We need to get a new bearded lady every once in a while. You need to get a new. Yeah, there's some people that can that come and go, but like relatively, especially in Utah, it's just such a small community. Um, and so if you're a dick or if you're bad or if you're not fun to be around, then everybody knows. If something happens on set in Logan, Utah, the people in Provo are going to know in an hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. Small Lake yeah. City. Yeah, Small Lake City. In <laughs> it is such a small, tight family. That even goes to like LA and Atlanta, too. Like It may seem like it's such a big industry, but like everybody is one person away from everyone in this industry, and anyone who's come from LA here and people I've worked with, it always links up. Like, For sure. Uh, I filmed a music video like six years ago with Legit Looks. It's a company out in LA. And the guy we just went and shot that video for had them color it. Oh, really? So it's like six years later, full circle, and it was like we linked up over that. So it's like it's still a small community. In totally. The I mean, film, the, the world is small. Utah's smaller. Film makes them both smaller. Like the Filmmakers in general keep connected, whether it's through Facebook or Instagram or whatever people use these days. Uh, it, it keeps you very close. I was up at Sundance yesterday. Two days ago? 
two days ago. You doing the Sundance grind, dude? Uh, you know, the film commission's great. They, uh, oh, did you do that screening? I went to a screening. They send, they'll, they'll send you an email like you did great on a movie. Here's some tickets if you want them. So I, I went and saw a picture the other night with Hunter, my girlfriend, and, uh, we're walking around main street and it's just like, Oh, there's that actor I worked with. Oh, there's that DP I worked with. Oh, which is probably why COVID blew up in the world was Sundance. But, uh, I mean, it's fun to see all these people that aren't from here coming back here and you're just reconnecting <clears throat> again, just makes the world smaller. Film makes the world smaller. It does. I don't know why. And maybe because we don't have a project on it and I've done it in years past, but Sundance doesn't give me the spark as it used to. Like, I'm not like, Oh, I need to go up to Sundance for sure. It's not um, the same. It used to be something so different. Just fun. Like there used to be, you used to be able to like hit up a buddy and, get into an event now i feel like it's so exclusive and so this that there's so many people coming from out of town to where like local people can't even get in it yeah it's tough because uh, like now i look at it and i'm like if i self-produce or direct or write a movie that goes somewhere i wanted to go to south by i want to go to south by i want to go through there i want to be a part of that process uh, it just feels like what sundance used to be mm -hmm. and and no rag on sundance they still do great things for independent filmmakers they open a lot of opportunities for people it just does feel different yep. than it used to be um the and, events and, there the nights there like it's it's different it's different and it now, feels like, more corporate -y now i yeah. feel like when i show I mean, up there's like cars on displays brand new cars for next year and i'm like, i'm not here to see your 2024 audi I want to watch some films. I will say, though, the Kia booth every year. Did they have that this year, the Globe? Yeah. In the parking lot where it's all see-through and yeah. the concerts in there. The Kia Globe is awesome. I go yeah, it's still, I think it's still, was it still a Kia event? Was that what was driving around? I think it was the Kia Telluride. Yeah, I saw good boy Johnny Shepard. No, it was Acura. That's what it was. It was Acura. It's not Kia anymore. It's Acura. Mm. Kind of the same vibe, though. For sure. For sure. Uh, shout out Johnny Shepard. Driving those folks, get that money. Uh, I saw him driving people down Main Street. Like, they, that's part. That's another part that's fun is like, you know, we just went through a strike here and uh, a lot of people have been unemployed for a while now. And so, like, when Sundance comes around, they do hire a lot of local people, whether they're drivers or event staff or if they just need help putting up tents. Like, it's an opportunity for people that may not be as successful in the film industry to go and, and network and meet more people. And even if you're just putting up a tent, you're rubbing shoulders with more filmmakers typically. Like At, at least someone who's passionate, willing enough to volunteer and just be involved with Sundance, which sometimes that's cool. For just, sure. To talk with people that are that passionate about what you do. I remember, I think my favorite showing that I ever saw at Sundance was Honey Boy. The Shia LaBeouf mm, dude, story. So yeah. good. And so I remember I, I got in to the opening night and Shia was sitting probably four seats in front of me, hoodie on, like was not interested in talking to people, but just like you could feel how proud he was of this project because like he's, he's never really been able to talk about what happened to him. As far as I know, maybe he has, maybe he's done no, some. I, I love this story and I follow that thing a lot. Like yeah. I love Honey Boy and his childhood and that whole how he documented it and created that for himself to reflect on that time in his life. Like that's what art is about. Yeah. I mean, you go from Shia LaBeouf in Transformers and all these other pictures but like he's i think he's a brilliant actor i think he's he's had a really tough life and he does some he, he makes some very bad decisions uh based off his relationship with other people and like yeah. how he treats people i think he's a brilliant actor and so like seeing honey boy helped me understand like why he is the way he is and that's what i loved about sundance originally is it was like independent films people telling whether it's like their life story or like a story that just means so much to them. And I think it's probably still that way, but it just feels way more corporate now. It, it feels mm -hmm. like you can't go well, you learn the, about a film. You have the big companies that have come in and like now an independent film is like $15 million. Yeah. And like, I'm sorry, but if you have $15 million to shoot an independent film, you're not an independent For sure. film anymore. Like that's big money. Agreed. Like, that is, I mean, that gets you to tier two union. Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. And so it's like Sundance used to be like the three to 300,000 to like a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, dude, you got shows showing up for like $30 million. And I'm yeah. like, I feel well, like, like it was attainable that are at one pre -sold point. Yeah. And like pre distributed and everything else. And it's like, it, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of. Yeah. And so it's lost its like, a little bit. you know, now it's yeah. just people posturing. Kind it of used thing. to be a thing where, like, when I was in middle school, I, I used to, we had like a film class after school. 
and that was where I first got into film. And we we made all these stupid videos. You know, we recreated Jackass. We made a video about a golden Twinkie, and that's how you save the world. Just the stupidest thing. But we did that because every year my parents would take us up to Sundance, and all my friends would come, and we did that for five six years. And it was so fun to see that and to get to watch that creativity happen and then us try to implement that at school. And that was like a goal for us at one day. Maybe one day we can be on these screens. It's just, it's not a thing anymore. It's not really a dream for me to try to get on to Sundance anymore. Because it's just, it's not where I can start and get I to. I can see where you're coming from. I don't think there's a day where I'm waking up going, man, I wish I could get a movie into Sundance anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's lost its like... Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. it used to be special to me in a way and the local it was more local obviously for us in utah and it just meant a lot more i feel like for sure than, than it does and now. and my two gripe like just while we're on the subject still um two gripes with sundance uh there was not one film made in utah in sundance this year wow mm -hmm. not one now yeah, I, it, doesn't... <laughs> it, it doesn't look great I, I will say that a lot of the projects we did i don't <laughs> think were sundance movies um, I think that it would be lovely to have at least one picture from Utah and Sundance, but, uh, like some of the ones I know applied, I'm like, that's not really a Sundance movie. Maybe that's a TIFF movie. Maybe that's a South by Southwest movie. And it's, yeah. it's just, I think there should be one movie from Utah and Sundance. Yeah. The other thing is, is like talking about the corporate and the buyouts and all that stuff. It was funny. Like you go from, I, I believe it was 12 Years a Slave, yeah. sold for the most money ever, and then the next year it was Palm Springs. And I think, it, I may be quoting these numbers wrong, but I think 12 Years a Slave was $15 million purchase, and Palm Springs, which is just like a fun comedy with Andy Sandberg, and it's like, I really enjoyed the picture, but that gets sold for $15 million and 69 cents. Like, it's just kind of like, it is a posturing thing, and... And that was always going to be a Hulu movie. Like, why was that at Sundance? Why right. was that purchased as something? Like, mm -hmm. exactly. It doesn't make any sense. Why does that get the sixty nine cents is funny, but also you went from Twelve Years a Slave, like this beautiful film, which you know I I don't love. I don't think anybody loves going and watching slavery films. No, mm -hmm. I, I don't know who that is for because it feels like. You talk it's to history. You know, it, it's it history happened. for sure. Like but it, it, you know, quoting um, Shane Gillis, he's like, every year there's a new slavery movie, and the white people are like, "Oh, I feel bad." And like, man, I'm glad you guys have this movie to, to black people, and the black people are like, well, "This isn't for us. This is for you." And it's like, I don't know who likes watching the movie. It makes everybody. <laughs> That's a good it makes point. Sense. It's it's and this is you know I, I'm not trying to make light of any of the situation. I just, every year there seems to be a slavery movie that gets a lot of acclaim and they're done very well. They're very pretty and it's very important to remember the history and things that happened. I just don't know. I don't want to watch them. Mm -hmm. It makes me sad. It makes it makes everybody sad. And that's good. It's good. Again, it's good to be reminded of the history so we don't repeat it. It's terrible things happen in this country. Um, but... I think I agree. Is there a point I think I agree with everything you're saying, though. Like, I don't think you could have said it better. Because at the end of the day, you're like watching it, and you're like, "Who is?" I just this don't know who it's for. for. Yeah. yeah, who is it for? That's very well said. If it's just as a reminder that we did shitty stuff, great. Keep making them because I'm I'm fine with that. I'm fine with acknowledging that bad things happened here, and we don't ever want to do that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just think maybe we can. Let it lie for a minute. Let it <laughs> let, let it chill. <laughs> One thing I want to jump back on a little bit that I want to attest to your character as someone in the film industry. When you say, uh -oh. like, because you and I started the same year, and I will admit, like, there was a point where, you know, I was trying to figure out my where I belonged and what my, like, road was, and Brent was helping me out, but there was a point where you seemed like you had a really good track and like you knew where you were going and i remember that day where i texted you and i was like can i just come over and like i have questions i just have questions and i wrote i think it was kind of silly but i wrote on a piece of paper like out 30 questions and you're like yeah bring over some beers and let's talk and it was like that few hours that we just sat down and i was like because i had years of experience doing social media and youtube and everything else but a film set's completely different and I think that's like the main point of our podcast and things we talk about are these people wanting to get into film. And you were like a huge advocate for me in that, that like to get in here. Cause I was like, where do I go? Who do I talk to? 
what's an executive producer versus producer? Who are the people that talk to on set? And it was all these questions that you were like, some of them you were like, I don't know. And some of them you were like, this, 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 and this. Oh, this is what I've learned. Oh, when I did this. And like, to me, it was like, and then we worked on a few projects and then you brought me in and that's how I met Charles and everything else happened from there. But when you say that you were open arms, you would help anyone, you would jump into that stuff. Like I can attest to that in his character. Like, and I think those type of people like speak. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Well, I appreciate that. I I appreciate that. And I can say for you, it was when you and I and Brent Geisler went to the North County veteran stand down and we went in in San Diego, Vista, Vista, California, uh, Brent Geisler, who is a local director and first assistant director in Utah, very good dude. Uh, his dad runs the NVCSD North Valley County, Veterans North, oh shoot, it's like North Valley County Stand Down, North Veteran County, I don't remember. It's sick as shit though. It's great. <laughs> they, they invite all of these homeless vets and vets to come to this park, essentially like this ranch for a few days and they provide uh dental work and Mm. optometry and haircuts and and clothes and shoes and food it's badass and they get a shower people that decked out yeah people that haven't showered in months get a shower and sleep in a bed cell phones they register them for insurance find family members for them like yeah and and we really had no idea what i i didn't know what we were going to do i had no clue i didn't okay I have a full different story. I had no clue where yeah, we were going to go. Yeah, I, I, I knew we were going to this event. I was told, bring a camera, yep. and we were going to shoot this event. Mm. And I was like, great. So I get on a plane, fly into San Diego, get picked up, and it's me, Brent, and Scooter. And we go to this ranch the next day, and we just proceeded to like watch this incredible event and document this incredible event as these people that need help got help for three days and it was just beautiful we interviewed people that worked there and got to see why they were there we got to learn the stories of a lot of people that ended up needing help and it was just like this crazy cool we're just sleeping in an apartment above a barn yeah that's next to like like, the emus and chickens like (laughs) we had emus outside our window and we're sleeping on these tiny beds i don't know how you fit i didn't (laughs) i didn't didn't fit. fit on the bed I remember being uncomfortable as hell. And but... we just got to go and shoot all of this for three days and just be a part of it and to be there like shoulder to shoulder with Brent and Scooter and we're just like running around dock st- like very run and gun dock style like <laughs> just shoot them into the sun and throw in some ND and see what happens. <laughs> like we don't have any lights. We don't have any diffusion. I learned, just... I learned one of my biggest lessons of filmmaking on that trip and I say it all the time and you say it now too and people who know Chris say it. But when in doubt, backlight it out. And there was a moment where we were inside of a church and there was nothing. Like, there's no lighting. We were just getting blasted with this light through the back window. And Coke goes, fuck it, shoot right into the light. <laughs> He's like, when in doubt, backlight it out. And we, like, silhouetted this lady in this interview where we had, like, no definition on her face. But it was so magical with, like, the light over her. And it, like, at that moment I learned it was, like, don't fight the environment, work with it. And that was like my biggest lesson learned with filming. It was like, use the environment to your advantage. Don't try to like use everything in your truck to fight against it. Yeah, young filmmakers, if you're ever outside and the sun's fighting you, just put the sun behind them. <laughs> you're not out, gonna backlight it out. You're not gonna win the battle fighting the harsh shadows <laughs> and harsh light on their face. Just turn them into the sun. If you have some sort of bounce, do it. <laughs> Just, Charles is cringing. Wisdom. Charles is cringing right now. Do you agree or disagree? No, I totally agree. Okay. Yeah, Don't ever it. have your subject facing the sun. It's gonna look terrible, and you're gonna regret it later. That's all. <laughs> Charles is better at this stuff than me, but I know I know enough to know. Don't do that. Where'd you two meet? When was you two? Andy Mac. Andy Mac. Yep. Andy, Andy Mac. Mac. He was on Grip. I was on Electric. That was my yep. first full time job in the film industry. Was uh, Ben Joe. Great what measure. was your first impression of Charles? Don't think about it. Go. He was great. He, he had this. <laughs> that was pretty good. He had this giant fro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Charles, Charles has crazy, 
curly hair and it was so long. And we talk was, about this and I feel like none of the viewers believe us because I'm like, Charles is like a hippie. Like, if you didn't know, you'd think he's in the back smoking. This guy, I, I'm pretty sure he was still sleeping on the ground when we met. <laughs> it, it was probably around that time where and he just had this giant fro looking like, what's the guy's name in The Simpsons? Sideshow Bob. Sideshow Bob. <laughs> it, but just like the nicest guy with the giant fro. And he's just like, hey, dude. How you doing? Who are you? <laughs> you gonna lift heavy shit? Cool. Bye. Just like you know, for those of you who have seen some of the previous uh, podcasts, Chonky is the guy who got me into the film industry. We have an extensive history through his brother, and uh, oh, you know Chonky's brother. Chonky's brother and I went to high school together. Oh, really? That's, uh, that's how Small Lake City. Small Lake City. Yeah. yeah. Um, and. Uh, there was one day where we something happened at this little uh, event, and Chunky said, "If you ever want to work in movies, you call me." And I was like, "Great!" But I was playing football at the time; had no intention of like going and pursuing it until my my football career was over. And I remember when that day came, I uh, called them and was like, "Hey, I'm taking you up on that. Can I buy you a drink? Can we just go meet? I just want to pick your brain for a little while." And I'm sitting there in this little restaurant bar by myself, just like pretty much at the bottom of my life at this point like you know not in a great spot and i hear this harley just revving outside and i look outside and there's skinny chonky outside <laughs> skinny with, chonky. with his sunglasses Wait, no, on have, i know have you seen him yeah i have oh yeah the yeah guys, i have to get my tattoo the guy changed looks great. and everything I, I look outside and there's just the high handlebars with the tassels and his sunglasses and he just pulls up looking like the coolest dude in all of utah <laughs> Uh, and, and he sits down. Did he have a beard at the time? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And we beard. just sit and we we talk for a little while. He's like, listen, I can't promise you anything. I'm not going to say I can get you a job. But <laughs> if something comes up, I'll give him your number. And I was like, that's all I can ask. <laughs> and like a month later, I got a call to go work uh, for a few days on Hereditary because some crazy things happened on that production. <laughs> Scooter just gained too much weight. You got the baby weight too? <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, and I went and I got to enjoy a few days of work on um, the production Hereditary where I was working shoulder to shoulder with Chonky and Alex Stein because some people had just, somebody yeah, went on vacation, somebody disappeared, the dolly grip quit for a period. Like a lot of stuff happened. Uh, and I got there and I was like, this is the best. I, <laughs> I want to do this forever. I'm getting just listening to an actress scream at a director and yep. I'm standing there like, this is the best. And get off set, get off set, go, go. And I'm like, I don't want to. Like, Watch the so, drama. So cool. oh, just this forever. your first few movies when shit hits a fan. You know what one I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. And like, I'm not going to get into any details, but we're on set, we're filming, these guys are operating, I'm ACing, helping them out, everything's going great. You were also producing, first ADing it? Uh, producing, first ADing, <laughs> B cam operator locations transpo a little bit of it all sometimes <laughs> crafty <laughs> mid shoot actors are acting everything's happening all of a sudden lights everything oh. shit hit the fan real quick and I remember just standing there going I got front row to this like I'm just watching this shit go down I'm not moving and same thing that probably went through your head I was like no okay, no what went through my head can... was okay. <laughs> damage control time oh, no no i meant probably same thing what went through your head back in the day oh not yeah, in that yeah, 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 yeah you had to deal with it i gotta watch yeah the hardest part about that we're not going to get into specifics of that because it's yeah. very personal to some people but it was yeah. like thinking uh trying to keep some some information under wraps until we could have a better way to handle a situation and uh the lights all turned on on the stage and i was the only producer on the film and uh having my friends come grab me and be like we gotta talk and i'm like <laughs> just uh, there was a moment where i was like damn they think i'm a bad dude like that was the hardest part about that it wasn't that, i don't care yeah. about the shoot day i don't care about the lights coming on in the middle of a scene it was just that like these people that are there working with me and like that i talked into taking the movie were like your friend you're a bad dude and so like that that hurt Maybe that was tough you felt that way i don't at least from Crew's side, I don't feel like anyone felt that way towards you at all. Maybe. The conversations that happened uh, outside <laughs> of that stage. And I don't know all until, the information. Yeah, so. until I could like tell them what was happening, what the plan was and stuff. It, it just like, it, it hurt to be like, 
what are you doing about like because i i'm always like i look out for my people i will always try to treat people with respect and make sure they're taken care of Mm -hmm. uh and so like that moment where like some of my closest friends are like fingers in my face i was like damn they think i'm a bad dude that was a tough day you saw it from third person a little bit oh yeah i was out of body experience like imagine the security cam in the ceiling watching this whole thing play out and like me watching playback like damn they don't like me right now i will say being on the other end of that the guy with the hand on the on the generator breaker and you're like are we doing this oh yeah shutting it down you're like Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I've been to that party too. Usually over money, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've been there having to hold some cards. No, I mean, the industry has its ups and downs and it has its ebbs and flows and I think it's how we how we, you know, steer the boat through it all and have each other's backs and communicate and you know, at the end of the day, you're working with your friends. So I think that kind of brings especially on your side cuz you have to make producers and the higher ups happy but you have to make your boys happy so oh, yeah you're kind of playing that balancing game non-stop as we just kind of get to go play for sure maybe not so much as a dp you have a lot more stress on your shoulders but for the yeah. most time we just get to go play the worst is um as an assistant director you're not above the line but you're you're right on that border right like you're right there and so when people don't want to go bring something to a producer they bring it to you and then you're in this bad middle ground where, like, really, you can't make the decision mm. to fix something. Like, if it involves safety or something like that, I can make the call. If it's something uh, that involves legal issues or something along those lines, like, I can't make the call. I now have to go relay that information to the producers. And it puts me in this weird middle ground because, yeah, you came and told me that something was bad. But I can't do anything about it. Like I need somebody above, like above my pay grade, and so I go to them, and they're trying to figure out. And I come back, and they're like, "What are you doing about it?" And I'm like, "I've done everything I can do. Like I will let you know as soon as I know." It's like if I'm a producer on something, I can make the call, and I'm so fine with making the call. I will always make the call I think is right and protect people and whatever. But as an assistant director, like it, let's say a director was misbehaving, I can't, I can't go to the director and be like you're fired (laughs) you know like i can't do that i can go to the producers and bring up what has happened and we can look into it and i I can be a part of that process but ultimately i can't make the call whereas uh, as a producer like if someone came up and was like this happened we need to do something about it like i can go do it and that's 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 the hard question maybe someone who doesn't know explain the role of like an executive producer versus like someone who's an assistant director or even a director does the director have the end say or does the producer god it's it's hairy and it's different between movies and television and it's different between uh a studio movie and an independent film like it's very very there's a ton of situations to take into account let's take for example like an independent film right um if the director raised the money and he wrote the script he or she wrote the script and got the money and hired a producer to help there's this weird line where you've hired this producer that's supposed to be over things uh but ultimately like this person raised the money the investors care about them it's their script like the director could tell the producer to eat shit and fire them whereas like on an executive like a network tell like a network movie let's say Netflix has their producer on the set and they've hired this director and the director is misbehaving like Netflix can go fire that Netflix producer can go fire that director. There's just it, it's ever flowing and ever changing between projects and um typically on movies like an executive producer is just somebody who gave money to the film or there's somebody who's they're giving a, a nice credit because they did adjustments to the script whereas in television an EP's very important role like they're mm. Uh, there's just a that, lot that part confused me a lot going into it because i always thought like oh directors in charge and then there would be a few times on set where like the executive producer would come in and be like fuck you director do it this way we purchased the script this way and this is how it's gonna go and the director's like yes sir and you're like oh who's in charge so yeah i think maybe some people would have that misunderstanding. It, and it, it's tough it, just because it's it's ever-changing, ever-flowing, and especially if like it's like the director's also <laughs> a producer or if there's a situation where, again, they wrote the script, they raised the money, it's their project. 
you can't touch them. Like unless an yeah. investor comes and says they're going to pull their money, uh, me as the producer can't go be like, hey, you can't shoot this like that. That's going to yeah, end up with me being gone really quick. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. There's like a, there's a lot that goes into it. I wish I had better information there, but it would take hours yeah. to. It ta- it took me a long, Another long time. time to even figure out my little spot. And I think the best advice Scoot taught me was he's like, you don't need to know who's necessarily in charge of everything. You just need to know who is your boss. If they got a chair back, <laughs> if they got a chair back, don't talk to them. Yeah. Oh no no no! And don't sit in those. I learned. <laughs> don't sit in their chair back. Yeah. Not sit. If there's so, a funny story, first job High School Musical. Who was the director on that? It was a lady, super nice blonde lady. I know it changed every episode. Or I know, but I think that was the, I can't remember her name. I think she's a director on P-Valley she's for HBO. Incredibly nice. She, I did not deserve half of like what she gave me. But long story short, Brent brought me in. He was first AD and introduced me to the director really quick. And she was so sweet. And she's like, what do you want to do in film? And I said, oh, and I answered really good at that time. And I think it was because I talked to you first. I said, oh, my 20-year goal is to direct, but right now I'm in the trenches doing anything I can to get the knowledge to get me there. And she goes, come sit by me for the day. And pulled up one of those chairs, and Brent came over, and he whispered in my ear, and he said, don't ever sit in a chair, get up now. (laughs) And, like, it was very direct, and I was, like, in this position where it's like, the director just told me to do this. Yeah. I was like, the director just told me to sit by her and kind of like look over her shoulder for the day. But then here's Brent, my boy, who brought me on for the day saying, don't do that. As the first AD. As the first AD. Well, and, and, and so it's... I went up to Brent, though, because I was nervous yeah. as hell, bro. I was like, shit. And I went up to Brent, and I'm like, Brent, she told me to sit next to her. Like, what do I do? And he's like, don't sit down. And so I didn't sit down. I got up after, and I like did my thing. But it was kind of this like... It's oh, it's position. tough. It is tough. Because that director's a do. guest in Utah, right? Like, yeah, that yeah. director came out here and is a guest in Utah. And then all of Utah crew would have seen me sitting down and being that And who guy. knows? Maybe maybe if you would have sat there for the day, that director takes you with her on every project. You don't know how that's going to end up. Yeah. I am not advising that you do that. <laughs> I don't Let me be clear. Yeah. Let me be clear. I don't either. And that's yeah. a very unique situation. Very, very, very unique. I, like... I'm pretty sure Scoot came up to me and told me he passed down his knowledge straight to me. It was on, I think it was on Roughneck or something, and we were on a break or something, and a lot of people weren't really there. You know, it was just kind of a, more of a downtime, and I, I sat in one of those chairs. Everyone remember, was off set, and you went on set, and you sat in a chair. one of the producer's chairs, yeah. And I remember Scoot comes up behind me, and no, it was on our MBA job or something, and I sat behind you guys in the... And your director chairs that you brought, and I remember Scoot coming up. Don't ever fucking sit in those chairs. And I was like, <laughs> "Shit, I'm like, lesson learned." Like, uh, we talked about babies. So and you're I gonna have sweaty. a kid. You've got a kid. chonky has got one. We talked about this in our last podcast because we we're. I'm freaking out. <laughs> and they're like, "Hey, let's talk about life on set with a kid." By the way, you're not going to have a life. And they just like go into this thing with me. They're like, you're not going to have time to spend any time with your kid being in film. And they just go down this whole Listen, rabbit hole. I, I know that's not true because I've seen you work a 13-hour day, go get in your van, go shoot a music video, sleep for two hours, and come back and go to another 13-hour day. I know you're capable of spending time between sets. You're not wrong. I've seen it. You're not I wrong. know that's true. Yeah, definitely. You're ready, man. I think, I think me and Evan have prepared you this summer as good as we can for destruction and damage and like you've been daddying evan (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah. roommates man roommates you know you got some like gotta gotta sometimes they need a little parenting or a little guidance Mm mm-hmm we did good though. Getting you don't ready. want him to burn your house down. He'll paint a wall and I'll just walk by and he'll be proud of himself. And I'm like, are you so excited for your kid to just come in and scribble all over it? And I'll walk off. And then you just <laughs> see him just. Yeah, pretty much anything I do in my life, they <laughs> revert it back to the kid thing for some reason. It's pretty it's chill. To stress me out. Yeah. But I like your energy. Just you come ready. in. Cope's like, here, have some whiskey, bro. Let's talk about life. <laughs> Let's chill. What are you going to do about it? Like. What are you going to do? Either you Make can... some more fun tokens and go have fun. Yeah. Make some money. <laughs> give your kid a good life. That's all you can do. Back, you can be worried about it or you can not be worried about it. It's still going to happen. So you're yeah. still going to have a kid. And if not, it's true. Your buddy's still gonna have a kid, and there's gonna be more kids around. There's so many kids. Yeah, I'm surrounded there's by so them many. Now. So many kids out there. 
Uh, I think you were actually. I have one more friend group left that doesn't have kids. After now, you're next, having, dog. Oh, oh, you're funny. <laughs> no way, dude. Uh, uh-uh. uh. I'm like you. I I enjoy spending my fun tokens. So yeah. And, if I without and one more, Cope's next. I'm liking this. Now that I now that I got it done, I can just put it all out on my friends. That's what you don't do. put that yeah. on me, man. Yeah. I want you to have a kid. And I want you to have a kid. <laughs> one day, Dakota. I want you to have a kid. Chunky, you should have another kid. Don't. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, on that note, <laughs> Chris, thanks for coming. Hey, thanks for having me. Hanging pleasure, out, dude. pleasure uh, being here. Let's get you in more. It's dude. fun having our friends. Yeah, I like someone to drink whiskey. We've got to wrap this up so I can do my Squid Games audition. Yeah, uh, <laughs> s- look for Squid Games: The Challenge go. Season Two. Watch for Chris Cope. Watch for me. <laughs> you remind me of a person that could be on Survivor. It's the buff. It's the buff and the beard. <laughs> yeah, I've already got it. And the ponytail. <laughs> the ponytail. Julian yeah. applied for Survivor. And, you know, <laughs> there's like 5 billion people that apply to that. It's a lot so. of people. A lot of people. <laughs> if you get on Squid Games, I'll be your number one fan. I, I, listen, I, I want to be on Squid Games, but I think there's a very, uh, with all of the, the randomness that happened on the show with like, player 278, eliminate one player. It's like, you can't really control your destiny on that show. It's yeah, more it's of a crap totally shoot, random. Which I'm about. I'm a gambler. I love, I love some <laughs> randomness. But... But uh, just to get on and be there would be would be a lot of fun. I didn't watch I will the f- kill people in their sleep. Yeah, facts. <laughs> but I didn't see the first season. Do you feel it's something that is – is it reality TV? Is it rigged? Or do we feel like it's an actual good game show? I feel like it's, I feel like it's a game show. I feel like there, there was stuff that they did that didn't make any sense to me as a viewer. Um, but I feel like – I don't think there was ever anybody eliminated – uh, by the writers. I'm going to say it like this. America's Got Talent, a lot of that stuff is completely scripted and staged. We know all this. All the way to the we know this. act. I'm yeah. going to say this. We know this. If it's on TV or social media, it's fake. What? It's all to get views and to make money. You know what's hilarious about this guy? <laughs> I, I just... He comes up to me the other day and he goes, what was it? Some video, he goes, I saw this on social... What was it? You were so excited about it you saw what was it it was probably some dog video do you know you saw something on social media and you're like did you know they could do this and i'm like charles did you know you threw a rock at my face on set and he's like oh yeah like, don't believe everything you see i just on the think internet, it's all fake just real quick on the squid games thing i think if they if it was rigged the person who won squid games would not have won just because, like, that's not the person you want to market. Like, no, I agree. The dude that took second? That's the biggest thing. Like, is the final 10 your, like, beautiful final 10? Or is the final 10, like, oh, they made it? There I, was just way more marketable people in, yeah. like, even the final 20. That if you're, if you're wanting to, like, parade around a champion for Netflix and for this crazy reality show, I don't think the person that won. Like Bachelorette. It's, it's rigged. I, I, I've only ever seen The Golden Bachelor, and I hated it. <laughs> Sorry to ruin it for anyone. The Bachelor, a lot Spoiled of that, all those for us. spoiler alert, is rigged. They know the winner going into the Do season. they really? Yeah. That sucks. Oh, I didn't know that. Wait, really? That sucks. Don't tell, I, am uh, I not supposed to say that? Don't no. tell Grandma. TV, She'll hate you guys. That. that sucks, man. There's no, I have friends who have been on The Bachelor, fake. and they knew going in that they weren't going to make it to the final five. Like, what what was that them. guy's name? That Brooks. Brooks. Did you know Brooks, the guy here uh-uh. that's like Brent's friend? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we met him a yeah. couple times. Oh, no, mine was a homie on Nitro, and he was like one of the contestants in the Australian Bachelorette. And No, they do stuff on all those reality TV shows. Like, you get producers come in, and they're like, here, you need to drink more. Well, no, they told me. Oh, for sure. They, know, sure like, dr- push they, paid, the they paid two of the homies to fight. Like for one of the episodes. I would do that. You walk up, give me a thousand bucks, go say punch that guy. (laughs) It's like, hey, each of you guys get a 500 bonus today if you get an argument. Deal. We'll do two. I like that though. It keeps it spicy. Like, what if everybody just went on a reality show? We're just friends. Yeah, and it just worked out. Nobody just wants to be like, hey, Dave. So glad your day went well. Right. Hey, we're both making That's our day so rate. Right. This yeah. is good. Life's good. <laughs> it's more fun. Give me 500 bucks. Tell him to go steal, throw his shoes in the fire. Yeah. You know, like. maybe you get married, maybe not. Yeah. That'd be good, Fuck, dude. You could be the you could be the bachelor next year. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you take this one. I'll get the next. You take this one. I'll get the next one. <laughs> She's brunette, by the way. <laughs>
Okay, uh, we're out. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks guys for staying tuned. Please uh, like and subscribe. And this is what happens when Cope brings Check out some of our other videos. <laughs> All right, peace out. We'll see you on the next one.